Well, thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, thank you, David and Donna and John, for all the water. I'm going to be floating away. <laughs> yeah. The, um, and also, though, I want to thank you for praying for me these last three weeks. I've had recuperating from the flu or whatever it is I had. I don't know what it was. But it just took a while. It usually affects my throat. And um, Mickey might have to turn this up because I may not be able to go so loud. But uh, I don't want to start coughing. But if I do, I'll turn my head. I'm not sick. It's just this nagging cough that's just kept on with me. Uh, so be patient with me as we dive into God's word and this teaching this morning. Um, we're going to be looking at the book of Habakkuk. Turn there, if you will, the Old Testament. We'll see what truths and lessons God has to tell us about faith in the midst of darkness. Uh, turn over there. It's between Nahum and Zephaniah. Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. We'll try to make it through all three chapters if we're able, as with time we have. Amos 3, 7 says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, or prophets, servants, the prophets. Let me pray. Father, I do thank you for bringing us here today. I ask that you give me the gift of teaching your word. This morning, I ask for your wisdom. I ask that the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, come in here and lead guide and direct it's all about you Lord Jesus it's all about you not about us for it's in Jesus blessed name I pray amen Habakkuk was a prophet of God battling much the same questions that Job and the writer of Psalm 73 did the fact that while God's people suffer the wicked seem to be prospering and go free so let's get a little background Times were hard in the days of Habakkuk. Judah was a nation that time and again boldly and unashamedly rebelled without shame to Jehovah God. They rebelled against him. They lived as though there were no God. Now there had been a great revival and had been led not by a prophet but by a king named Josiah. Keep your place there. And turn back with me to 2 Chronicles, chapter 34. And you'll see what was happening just before the days of Habakkuk. We see that Josiah was a very young child when he became king, only eight years old. And he reigned 130 years. And so you can figure out how old he was by the end of his reign. The Bible says there in verse 2, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of David his father. And you notice that he didn't compromise here. The Bible says he declined neither to the right hand or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, the eighth year of his reign, any teenagers in here, listen to this, listen. In the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father. You see that? When he was 16 years old, he made a definite decision regarding walking with God. And in the 12th year, it says, that means when he was about 20 years old, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. Verse 4 tells us at his direction, Josiah, he had all those carved and molten images, altars of Baal, he had them all torn down, tore them all down. That wicked and corrupt stuff. They got rid of it. They broke it in pieces, ground it to powder, scattered it into the graves of those who'd sacrificed to him, and even burned the bones of those idolatrous priests. He said, let's clean it up. The incense altars to these false gods, the Asherim they were known, the idols that raised high above, and he chopped them down. If you research the archaeology of the Old Testament and the history, I believe it's uh, Unger's archaeological, archaeolo uh, 
archaeology of the Old Testament. But uh, he says connected with those Asherine gods, they're some of the most pornographic of all the literature. It was so obscene, he couldn't include it in the book he was publishing. So Josiah cleaned the land. And Judah walked with God, but time passed. Time passed, and Josiah died. Another king came, and another, and another. Other prophets, and soon back again to false prophets. And by now, Judah's forgotten the days of Josiah. They'd forgotten God. They're living in wickedness. Does that remind you of anything today? Amen. The land of the free and the home of the brave. Once been a light on a shining hill. Mm. What's happened? I read an article from a spirit-filled born-again missionaries who are from other countries. They've been coming to America to witness, to evangelize, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ here. That's right. Why is that? Well, this is what they said, quote, America is in trouble. It's lost its spiritual zeal with growing materialism, secularism, humanism, and sexual immorality. It's no longer a city on a hill or a beacon of light, well on its way to becoming like the now secular and dark continent of Europe. In times past, it was a dominant missionary sending nation, but now it's seen as a nation that's lost its foothold as a Christian influence. Its churches are great in number, but they are weak in spirit, no longer preaching the gospel truth. Whew. I have an article, another one, written recently by an author named and writer, you've heard of her, Linda Kimball. Listen to what she says. A black wing overshadows our land. In its darkness, we see able-bodied people with no work ethic electing to sit at home and live off the productive while in the la latest round of closings due to lawlessness, crime, and violence. Then there are monstrous pedophile rings operating at the highest levels of global power on down to the mean streets of society. These predators prey on and sadistically torture babies and children, often murder them. Demonic occultism is on the rise throughout society and church, even as Satanists, Satanists brazenly celebrate the transgender horned demon Baphomet in public displays in our schools. The evil murdering, aborting babies is now a good thing. Protecting them is evil. And children are mutilated and transitioned to the opposite sex by doctors playing at being gods. This crime against nature is also a good thing according to the wicked. While road ragers terrorize and murder motorists on our highways and byways inside the beltway of our government and intelligence community mainly consists of depraved psychopaths, cowards, liars, thieves, and political prostitutes selling themselves and our nation's wealth and resources to the highest bidders. Our military, once the envy of the world, is being reduced to an LGBTQ plus and transgender drag queen laughing stock while an all-out invasion of our land is underway at our unprotected borders. Marching smartly to the beat of disorder, depravity, and madness is the Vatican and much of the Western and American church. At the apex of global power is a cabal of dark personalities, psychopaths, scheming to seize control of the whole wide world, massively, massively depopulate it, and force the remaining slaves to subsist on bugs and genetically engineered fake meat. They will not be allowed to own anything, but will be happy, say these psychopaths. As evil, violence, murder, and mayhem Explode across our land, decent people flee broken, disordered towns and cities in search of safe harbors, while faithful Christian prayer warriors lift their voices up to God the Father, earnestly praying for an end to this evil. No greater light has ever been poured onto two civilizations than onto Christendom and Protestant America, but sons of Cain preferred darkness to light and together with their simple-minded followers declared the death of Jesus Christ in their hearts. Utopia, they triumphantly declared, is where God's truth and sin are not. And we are free to actualize ourselves, unite Mr. Hyde and Dr. Jekyll, and be the measure of all things. Now, as our land breaks apart and cities burn in furnaces of unfettered sin and violence, 
the Lord our God speaks to the unrighteous in a dreadful wrath-filled voice saying, do you finally see your sinfulness, the stupidity, depravity, and evil in your hearts? You may not like that kind of talk, but I believe she accurately describes our country Amen. and much of this world for that matter. Well, there's a sleeping giant that's raising up called Babylon, and in Habakkuk it's called Chaldea. The Chaldeans, Babylon is starting to stretch itself. It's showing its might. It's a godless nation, and they're just coming into their own. And we see that evil spirit of darkness and wickedness right here around us all today. And we're seeing this antichrist beast system falling into place, just as the Bible prophesied. Now, these Chaldeans, as they are described by Habakkuk, didn't have an ounce of sensitivity in their bones. I mean, they were a people without the Spirit of God. And when they came into villages, they literally raped their way through. At times, they'd stack the skulls of those they'd killed in a pyramid-shaped mounds. And you know that they had been there and conquered the city by the mounds of skulls that were mounded outside the gate. And so in verse 1, Habakkuk, Chapter 1, verse 1, begins with a problem, a burden. The burden which Habakkuk, the prophet, did see. Now the burden has to do with something carried. A load born with difficulty that, that is grievous. It's wearisome. It's oppressive. Habakkuk's a man with a crushed heart. A deep burden. The mystery of the silence of God in the face of human suffering and despair and injustice, persecution and woe, he, that added to this godly man's burden. Look at verse 2. O Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou wilt not hear, and even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. So we find Habakkuk praying. He prays and he prays some more. There doesn't seem to be an answer. Rather than the situation getting better, it seems to be getting worse. And he says, God, how long am I going to have to cry to you? Everywhere the prophet looked, he saw violence and injustice and, and wickedness. He was sick of seeing, seeing all this wrongdoing and fearful of what it would bring. Do you see that there he uses the word cry twice? Look at that. The first word cry means cry like a plea for help. But the second word, cry, is a different Hebrew word, and it means a shout or a scream. I mean, he's quit act, asking and started screaming at God. He thinks God is deaf. Why, God, don't you do something? I mean, it's, he's almost angry. He's screaming out and pleading to God for help, but it seems like the heavens are silent. Has it ever been that way with you? I mean, have you ever had a problem you cry out to God and you get to the place where it's like you almost start to shout at God. I mean, you find yourself arguing with him and say, God, why don't you do something here? But there doesn't seem to be an answer. You say, Lord, how long am I going to have to keep praying about this deal? What's going on? What's happening? To Habakkuk, God just seemed to be indifferent, like he's got his arms folded. You know, he's not doing a thing about the situation. Look here, at verse 3 and 4. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievous? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are they that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth ever, never go forth. For the wicked doth compass a compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. He's saying, Lord, haven't you noticed lately? Haven't you looked down here? Everything's a mess. And there's violence everywhere. Evil is rampant. Habakkuk comes up basically here in this verses with four conclusions. The law is slacked, number one. Number two, justice is never upheld. It doesn't go forth. Number three, the wicked doth compass or surround the righteous. Number four, therefore when justice does come, it's wrong. Hmm. You see that? Habakkuk is saying, I've got a complaint, Lord. I'm wanting you to know about it. In verse 2 and 3, his words are how long. You see that? He talks about how long and the word why. He mentions those words. Those are two questions we ask a lot, isn't it? Amen. Constantly. 
And a lot of times, most often, God doesn't give us an answer. God never tells Habakkuk why, and he doesn't answer how long. I mean, Habakkuk looks at the world and he says, this nation I'm in is godless. It reeks. Don't you see it, Lord? And if you're the holy God of heaven, how could you stand back and let this madness continue? Now, Jeremiah was a contemporary of Habakkuk. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 8, 12, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Mm. Jeremiah and Habakkuk lived with a generation of unblushables. They were proud of their sin. We live in the same kind of generation, folks. We pray and we pray. We wonder what's going on around us. And we're praying. What's happened to this country? What's happened to this world? Everyone's gone insane. We cry out to God and say, God, you're the only one who could do anything about it. Please do something. And God doesn't seem to do anything. As far as Habakkuk, he's saying, Lord, step in. Give me some help. I'm seeing it go down in the tubes. I'm wondering where you are. He's wondering if God is even hearing him. If he even cares a little bit. We see that God graciously answers this prophet. Tells him what he's going to do in verses 5 and 6. Look at it with me. Behold ye among the heathen in regard and wonder marvelously. For I will work a work in your days which you will not believe. Though it be told you. So Habakkuk's complaining, tell me, God, what you're going to do. I'll believe it. And God says, you won't believe it. You won't. You won't believe it if I told you. Habakkuk says, I will. Tell me. I'll believe it. God tells him, I'm going to use the Chaldeans. Habakkuk says, I can't believe it. No, you've got to be kidding me. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans in verse 6, that bitter and hasty nation which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. And so God continues to answer Habakkuk with a vivid description of these Chaldeans in verses 7 through 11. In summary, basically, he says they're terrible and dreadful. Their horses are swifter than leopards. They're more fierce than the evening wolves. They'll come all for violence. They'll gather into captivity as the sand. They scoff at kings. They deride every stronghold. In other words, they laugh at every fortress. For they shall heap dust, meaning that when they get a wall... And they can't get over it. They've got so many troops. They'll, they'll bring in all the debris and rubble and stack it up against that wall and so that they just climb above it and get over it and take it. And then in 11, then shall his mind change and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this his power unto his God. Mm. Isn't this so much like us? I mean, Lord, aren't you going to come to my rescue here? Aren't you going to deal with this situation that I'm finding myself in, whatever it is? You fill in the blank. Can't you see how bad things are? Prove your character, God. Answer my prayer. God says, all right, this is what I'm going to do. Oh, I can't believe you're going to do that, Lord. (laughs) Look at verses 12 through 17. We see Habakkuk answering back to God. He said, art thou not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, mine holy one? You see, Habakkuk's pleading to God here. Habakkuk was admitting God's perspective was infinite, much bigger and wider than his. The truth of God's existence, if he's eternal existence, didn't confuse Habakkuk at all. No, he acknowledged the holiness of God. And he knew that it called for the punishment of, of sinful Judah. But he couldn't understand how God could use who's holy, could be, have any dealings with the sinful Chaldeans. Notice how many times in verses 12 through 17, he mentions they and them and their. You'll get the picture. I mean, Habakkuk says, I can't believe it, that God's bringing judgment and correction to his people, the Jews. You're picking on the wrong crowd. You're confused, Lord. It's the Chaldeans. They're the ones. And so here his thinking is in verse, his rationale in verse 13. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them? 
that deal treacherously and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth a man that is more righteous than he? We're Jews, Lord. Remember, we're your people. We're promised an eternal destiny. You're going to bring in the Chaldeans? Lord, you're going to use them to correct us. Your eyes are too pure to approve of such evil. How can you use something more wicked to clean up something that's wicked? They're a lot worse. And they're evil. That doesn't make sense, God. Well, God said to him, I told you you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> that's the reason I told you. Because you couldn't understand it. You remember Jesus said in John, what, 6, 16, 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Listen, we don't live by explanations. We live by promises, the promises of Almighty God. And God's not bound to have to explain to us things that we couldn't understand and wouldn't receive anyway. Don't you think God knows exactly what he's doing? Sure he does. But Habakkuk has a hard time understanding and comprehending it. Many of us today that live in this country have the idea that we're God's favorite. That's because we're Christians and because we're Americans. We're not going to know any real trouble or tribulation. Hmm. They equate Christian with being an American. Vice versa. There's nothing could be further from the truth than that. Amen. They think that, that we're just going to live our lives in peace and freedom from the problems of this world and then... The rapture's going to come and take us away. Isn't that the way most Americans feel and say they're Christian? I mean, sure it is. We're bad, but we're not that bad. We've got our crime. We've got our abortion, our rape. I know we've got our robberies, our pornography, our trafficking, our drugs and materialism and so on, and we've got our pride. At least we've seen God bless America at all the ball games. And we put in God we trust on our money. Uh, and we pridefully at least, at least we've got churches everywhere on every corner, Lord. Even though the, most all the churches aren't preaching the truth, just that watered down, feel good bunch of sensitive seeker junk that has nothing to do with the truth in God's word in this Bible. We may be bad, but we're not as bad as they are, those other countries and so on. And we say, hey, Things are going to get better when we get a new president. Hey, yeah, I mean, you know, we'll make America great again. God is on our side. Hogwash, bunch of bull. No, 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 no. Amen. If you're believing that, you're either totally blind or don't see what's coming and you have your head stuck in the sand. If you're thinking that way, in other words, that we're not going to experience any kind of tribulation, difficulties, or events that are going to cause you trouble. I'm telling you, like our dear preacher says, you're in la-la land. That's right. Now, I'm not saying that we as God's children, true believers in Christ, are going to go through the great tribulation. I'm not saying that. It's going to be hell on earth when the Antichrist comes to reign. But what I am saying is this. The Bible teaches us that all these things we see happening in our world right now, many times it casts a shadow ahead of time. It does. Jesus said in Mark 13, 8, For nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in divers places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. These are the birth pangs, folks. And we're seeing them so close, they're getting closer and closer and closer together. Aren't they, David? I'm telling you they are. Matter of fact is that the end of the age, as Jesus revealed in the Scripture, is upon us. Time is almost up. Amen. America's been cursed with blessing. And very soon, it's quite possible we're going to be blessed with cursings. In times past, when God did bless our nation, and he did, we didn't turn to him. Oh, some did. But as a whole, no. We became independent from him. We got further and further away from the Lord our God, tolerating everything that opposes God and the truth in this Bible. There may be only one thing that this nation can understand that's 
some total disaster that'll drive us to our knees. But I'm not even sure about that anymore. Lines are being drawn and people are taking sides and there's talk about nuclear exchange now somewhere sometime. I don't know where this country is in the prophetic timetable of God, but it's a minute to midnight. And time is short, so we'd better get our house in order. Make sure you've been saved by the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you've believed on Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. He's the only way of salvation, folks. But Satan and all of the global elite and Satan's minion of this world, they operate on what they think is their own timetable. <laughs> they don't have a clue that the Lord God Almighty is in control of it all. But you can be sure they're going to do everything and anything they can to man manipulate you, to warp your mind, to get Bible believers sidetracked onto other things, to shut your mouth about the truth that's in this Bible, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Listen, God's not about protecting our way of life or anything like that. God's about bringing glory to himself. So right now, Habakkuk is totally confused. He makes the most important decision, though, his entire life in ministry. He decides to get alone with God. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. He decides to listen, to wait on God, to get a right perspective. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the high tower, and I will watch and see what he will say to me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. So Habakkuk stops shouting and arguing with God. He's confused and uncertain. Yes, he doesn't know what to say to the people anymore. He doesn't know how to pray he knows this much. Amidst in the pulpit puts a fog in the pew. You ever heard that? If he's not certain, doesn't have a clear message from God, the people that he ministers to are going to be uncertain. 1 Corinthians 14, 8 says, For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? And his trumpet was clogged up. He doesn't know what to say. He doesn't know what causes sound. And so he says, I'm going to say nothing. I, I'm going to listen. I'm going to get, I'm going to wait on this tower for God to speak. Listen, we're never more effective in all our lives than we make the decision to stop and rest in God. Stop the complaining. Stop the wrestling. Stop the fighting. Stop the inner churning. So Habakkuk says, I'm going to wait. I'm going to listen. I'm going to see what God has to say to me. I've said it before. I'll say it again. We mutter and we sputter. We fume and we spurt. We mumble and grumble. Our feelings get hurt. We don't understand things. Our vision grows dim when what we needed was a moment with him. So God gives a vision to Habakkuk that spells out the Chaldeans and their certain doom. God knows all about the Chaldeans, folks. He knows about that situation. Listen, God knows your enemy. God knows the frustration and anxiety you're under. He knows why. He knows how long. He knows what it's going to do in your life and mine. He knows the depths of which it'll go. God knows your situation and mine. He just wants us to realize where we are in our relationship with him. He wants a heart that comes to him in honesty so we can hear him when he speaks, to stand still in his sovereign will. The Chaldeans and the Babylonians and all that are like them, they're no problem for God. Never have been and never will be. I can tell you before every major important decision in my life, God's brought me to a point where I once had to stop my finagling and finiggling and finding and trying to figure things out and to just wait on the Lord to listen to him because God, God's answer doesn't come on our schedule. It doesn't come on my schedule sometimes. I had to get away and just wait for God to clear the fog and to quieten my spirit. And so Habakkuk was listening and waiting. While he was doing that, we find in chapter 2 that God answered Habakkuk. 
gave him a proper perspective, and God didn't disappoint. Nope. He taught him three things. The Holy Ghost spoke to this servant about the truth and the timing and the trustworthiness of God. God had to show Habakkuk the truth. What is the truth? The reliability of Scripture. It's so important we read verse 2 that we don't miss it. Look at there. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tables that he may readeth it. He may run that readeth it. Now what God said was this. Habakkuk, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to give you a vision. I'm going to speak to you. And that's when I give you a revelation here. I want you to write it down. Get some tablets. Just write it down and make it plain so that somebody can read it and run with the message. And what Habakkuk wrote was his book that we have right here. Right here. The Word of God that we're reading right now. This is what he wrote. This is what he wrote in that high tower. Now look what he said in verse 3 about the prophecy. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. In other words, it's not yet happened, but it's going to happen. But at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, here it is, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. God tells Habakkuk, I know what I'm doing. You wait for me as I give a vision. You record that vision. That's for us to read for all time. That's my word of counsel and my encouragement to you, Habakkuk. Listen, God's timing of things that happen in our lives and our world is his prophetic timetable. It's of God's choosing, not ours. The principle here in verse 3 applies to all the prophecies in this Bible. The prophecies regarding the first coming of Christ took centuries to be fulfilled, but in the end, every single one of them were proven to be accurate to the letter. And the prophecies of the second coming of Christ, with all that we see happening in the world now, are absolutely coming to life as end times events are unfolding right now before our eyes. The trustworthiness of God is something you can depend on, folks. God has given us some rock-solid eternal promises in this Bible that are totally sure, totally trustworthy. In other words, you can trust the Word of God. That's good. It's true that at times between the beginning and the end, things are going to look very confusing to us. But based on the truth in this Bible, we're getting close to going home, aren't we? Amen? But before we go, many times we're going to want to question God and shout at God and tell God how, why, and so on. And God says, look, Habakkuk, you just write it down. Just write it down. Make it big, make it plain, make it straight. God's word is true. You can trust my word whenever there's darkness all around. It seems to be coming apart and go, at going haywire at the seams, even when you don't understand it. F.B. Meyer said this. He said, if any promise of God should fail, the heavens would clothe themselves with sackcloth. The sun, moon, and stars would reel from their courses. The universe would rock, and a hollow wind would moan through a ruined creation, the awful message that God can lie. Listen, God can't lie. No, no. And aren't you grateful for this Bible? Mm, mm, mm. In the days we're living, and be able to turn through the pages of it and know that it's the truth, that God cannot lie. Though it tarry, I'll wait for it. There are things that we don't understand. If I can't understand it, I'll still stand on the word of God. I'll just wait. Have faith in God, B.B. McKinney wrote. He's on his throne. Have faith in God. He watches o'er his own. He cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith in God. I say, have faith in God. We've got to say, I'm going to take God as his word. No matter what. Have you come to that place? Well, I hope you have. No matter what haters of God are saying, the doubters of God's word that say something's wrong with all these prophecies. They just want to question everything, saying, well... Satan's whispering in your ear. Maybe God's, got, God's not going to keep his word. Maybe the earth won't be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. Maybe Jesus won't reign. Look, Habakkuk said, if it doesn't seem to be happening on time, I'm going to wait. God cannot lie. He will not fail. Many people today all over, some of us here may feel like you, you know, you're slipping or you know, forgetting where you were brought from. I mean, things are rough, getting rougher. We see rottenness going on in this nation all around the world. But the fact is, God knows exactly 
what's going on, and he's in control of it all. He's in control of the arrangement for these world events that are happening. He's not on the edge of heaven worrying, thumbing, you know, worrying about what's going to happen, what's it going to do with us, or what's it going to do with these nations. No. God's got a plan that will never be frustrated no matter how wicked people might get. And in fact, you might be the Habakkuk of this generation, wherever you are. I mean, it's important that whatever you're calling, we've got to be sure that in our working, our writing, our speaking, our, our whatever you're doing, that we're hearing God's voice, that it's of God and for his glory. So after telling Habakkuk what to write, God tells him to wait in verses 3 through 5. In the meantime, God spells out the conditions of those people in Chaldea or Babylon. In verse 4, God says they're proud and their souls aren't right within them. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not right in him, but, see that but? In other words, in contrast to them, what? The just shall live by his faith. The scripture's been echoed. That scripture's been echoed down through the centuries. Quoted three times in the New Testament. It's the key to the book of Habakkuk and the key to God's dealings with every one of us. In Romans 1, 17, the emphasis is on the just. In Galatians 3, 11, it's on faith. And in Hebrews 10, 36, it's on live. In fact, it was this very verse in the word of God written by Paul in Romans that later turned the life of Martin Luther around and lit the torch of the Reformation. The just shall live by faith. God's saying if you live by feelings, Habakkuk, Keith, David, Ronnie, if you, Tom, put, fill in your name. If you live by feelings like that, you're going to find yourself curled up in some corner, hiding, trembling, quaking in your boots with fear. But if you live by faith, God says, you listen to me. You listen to me. You trust me. You look to me. You speak for me. You live by faith. That's your marching orders. Amen, God. Thank you. Habakkuk thought he was going to tell God about how he ought to go ahead and bring judgment and punishment to those Chaldeans. God had an answer. In verse 5, he begins to talk about the sinners. And he says, yea, also, because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home who enlargeth his desire as hell, and as, is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all peoples. Shall not all these take up a parable against him, and a taunting proverb against him, and say, Woe to him? And so in verses 6 through 20, he gives five woes to the Chaldeans. Woe to him in verse 6. He speaks of dishonesty. In verse 9, woe to him. He speaks of greed. In verse 12, woe to him. He speaks of violence and absolute cruelty. In verse 15, woe to him. He speaks of immorality and carousing. And in verse 19, woe to him. He speaks of idolatry. And God says, Habakkuk, listen to me, son. Listen, I know all about these sins, and I'm going to judge every single one of them. Are you listening? If you're a sinner without the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, don't ever think because God isn't judging your sin now that he won't judge your sin. He will judge. He will judge. Don't ever think that God has let sin get by. No, no. Paul was clear in Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever soever a man soweth that shall he also reap. These Babylonians, these Chaldeans coming down here high and mighty were saying, well, if, this, if there is a God, he doesn't judge sin. Look what we're doing to his people. But God says in Romans 14, 11, I have a record of every one of them. For it's written as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. God showed Habakkuk the punishment of the sinner and of those Chaldeans. God's going to punish every sin, folks. He's also showed him that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to rule and he's going to reign. Amen. Look at this wonderful verse. That verse, in, we passed by it in chapter 2. I mentioned it, chapter 2, verse 14. What a promise it is. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Man, 
Isn't that a beautiful promise? It is. Makes you smile, doesn't it? Yeah. Remember, this past Wednesday night, our preacher quoted the prayer of Jesus, Matthew 6, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. I'm telling you, all the forces of hell and all the powers of sin, all the doubts of people won't stop the enthronement of our dear Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You can thank God for this promise in chapter 2, verse 14. And God tells Habakkuk, you and me, just wait for it. Because it'll surely come. It won't tarry. You hear that? Jesus is coming, folks. Might be today. Might be right now. I hope so. That we're going to be caught up to meet him in the air. Are you trusting God's word? It'll come. Wait on it. God's word is true. Now, if you believe that, I'm telling you, that's something you can hold on to. You can sink your teeth into that. Because there's going to be a lot of things we won't understand. There's going to be a lot of things we don't know. We've got to get it out of the, on, into the high tower or down in our prayer closet, folks. We've got to get in there and let God start speaking to us. Now, let's quickly look at chapter 3 in the next 10 minutes. It's absolutely profound. And here it is that Habakkuk expresses his highest prayer of praise to the Almighty. In verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet upon Shiganoth. O Lord, I've heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. What, is mean, mean, what does he mean by Shiganoth? I mean, I didn't know what that was. I had to look it up. Most believe it's a Hebrew word that means a prayer, a song with a loud cry in a time of danger or joy or a prayer expressing deep feelings. What's happened is, is that the springs of joy in the heart and soul of Habakkuk had just busted loose. And he's saying, this is not just an ordinary prayer. This is a prayer that's upon Shiganoth. I mean, I'm letting it out. My feelings, I'm letting it out. It's a prayer with deep feeling. God has shown me something and my eyes are brimming with tears. And my lips are just busting out in praise because of what I've seen. God shows him something here. Habakkuk acknowledged that he'd heard from God and tasted fear. It felt like he was in the midst of years. Maybe between the flood and the apocalypse. He prayed for the mercy of God there. He saw, he saw the Lord's presence in verses 3 through 5. He saw him coming from the far south of Judah and stepping on Edom or Timon, in his brightness and power. And in verses 6 through 9, he saw the Lord tearing apart the world and his wrath against the sea. And he remembered his word and his covenant to his people. And in verses 9 through 15, Habakkuk saw all of the nature and all of the nations trembling. And he prophesied, the Lord's coming in glory. This third chapter is a song of praise in a time of crisis, folks. How do we know? The praise of this prophet is rooted in the revelation of God and the truth that God gave to him. God gave him the revelation of himself. Listen, it's not just what God's doing, but it has to do with who God is. You see, that's a lot more important. Are you following me? God couldn't explain to us what he's doing anyway. How do we know? Because he told us in Isaiah 55, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Right? So it's better to know who than why. Isn't that right? I mean, so many times we get in trouble and we say, God, Why? I guess we think if God explained it to us, you know, we'd feel better. I don't think so. I think we'd probably feel worse. A lot of times we say, no, God, you've got it wrong. That's not the way to do it. You know, Lord, I really don't want this. I don't want that. And so God doesn't explain it to us, and he just shows us himself. And you see, here's when Habakkuk got a revelation, a vision from God. I want you to notice the word Selah. God came from Timon. In verse 3, the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah, his glory covered the heavens. The earth was full of his praise. Look in verse 9. Thy bow was made quite naked according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word, Selah. Look at verse 13. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people. Even for salvation without anointed, thou woundest the head 
out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck, Selah. Selah means, just think about that. Selah, meditate on that. Here's Habakkuk, he says, I'm just going to praise God. And he does it with deep feeling and emotion and joy as he's reminded and given a revelation of God's majesty, how God came from Paran. That's where the law was given. Do you know that? Mount Sinai, where the thunderings and quakings were on that mountain. And he speaks of the majesty of God. And in verse 9, he mentions the rainbow that speaks of God's mercy. That's God of majesty and God of mercy who keeps covenants and providence, promises. God had forgotten that he has a covenant relationship with the nation of Israel. And in verses 9 through 11, all nature trembled. He saw the mountains trembling, upheavals in the earth, changes in the sky. He was seeing all this. In verses 12 through 15, he saw all the nations trembling. The Lord Jesus Christ returns to reign and goes forth to make war on his enemies and bring salvation to his people. Just when the Jews are at the end of their resources and facing extermination. Man, that speaks of God's might. Listen, Habakkuk saw how the Lord will overturn the Antichrist kingdom from top to bottom. He'll turn it upside down and put an end to it. For the third and last time in Selah in verse 13. There, what do you think of that? What happened in all of this is Habakkuk forgot the answer. Or question why did he turn to his attention of who? God of might. We need to ask ourselves, is God is God of majesty and rules over all? He's a God of mercy and he loves you. He loves you in spite of your sin and yourself because you love him. He's a God of might. Don't you think we ought to think about it? I do. But instead of remembering that, sometimes in the midst of darkness, what do we do? We start feeling, oh, what do we do? What do we do? Get our eyes off the Lord and start looking at our circumstances. Listen, we've got to draw close to the Lord in these days, folks. Give him praise and thanks for who he is because he's got it all under control. So Habakkuk says in 16, when I heard my belly tremble, my lips quivered, voice, rottenness entered my bones, I trembled myself, that I might rest in the day of trouble. Get that. When he cometh unto the people. Habakkuk was saying, I'm scared, I'm worried, I'm scared stiff. But when I think about what's going to happen, my stomach churns, my lips tremble, my bones turn to water and to rottenness, but I'm going to rest in the day of trouble. Wow, do you see that? Talk about being committed and yielded to God's will. I see it's going to happen. I rest in God. It's in your strength, Lord, not my own. I'm counting on you. I'm trusting you to see me through it. Listen, a Christian, we're almost done, who praises and trusts God isn't naive or some sentimental optimist or a gloomy pessimist either. He sees things exactly as it is. Yes, we know dark days are ahead. They're, they're coming. They're here. But we also know we've got the absolute truth and promise of God as we look for our blessed hope and the glorious, glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is coming to take us home. Amen. And yes, on this side we see the world in all of its misery and mess. But we're praising God and we're rejoicing because we see what's ahead for us. question is, are you ready? Let's read these last two verses. 17, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. In plainer words, he's saying there's nothing left, nothing. But look, yet, see that word, circle that, yet. Yet what? Yet, in other words, no matter what, no matter what comes, yet I will tr rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like hind's feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. So, folks, as we come to a close here, have you got that kind of faith? Where's your joy in the midst of darkness? Habakkuk said, yet... Well, I joy in the God of my salvation. Amen. Listen, he didn't get his joy from circumstances. No, 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 no. Habakkuk was sure of God because he had the promise and truth of God's word about the mess the world was in in his day and what was coming. He saw it.
God showed him, and he said, My joy, my joy's in the Lord. His eyes were fixed on the Lord. He had a revelation of God's greatness. And we've got that same revelation, don't we? Yes, it's right here, right here in this Bible. God's laid it all out. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So I ask about it. I ask you, is your joy in the God of your salvation? Is the joy of the Lord your strength? In the midst of this darkness all around, the Lord Jesus Christ is your only hope. I'm going to read this slowly as we close. In Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Pause. Meditate on it and let it sink in. Selah. What do you think of that? Father, I do thank you for your love and grace, for your promises in the days we're in. For we rejoice in your coming and we look to hear a shout soon. But until then, Lord God, we live by faith, trusting you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I pray the Holy Ghost come in this place in the upcoming service we worship you in spirit and truth. I ask in Jesus' name that you anoint the preaching of your word, that Jesus be lifted up, hearts be receptive to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.